1905 to 1909, when Einstein and Lenin took on Mach. Now you may be wondering why I link the name of these two people. Well, you may not know it, but both of them were socialists. And during the years in question, they both carried out a devastating critique, implicit in one case, explicit in the other, of the ideas of the Austrian philosopher Mach. Let me explain. My motivation in this is to persuade people to actually read Lenin's contribution to it, Materialism and Empiric Criticism. It's certainly a bit easier to read than Einstein's contribution, but I'll give you the references to Einstein's articles later. And it was written by the famous social democrat Vladimir Lenin, who was then a Russian politician in opposition, to counter the spread of a form of fashionable subjectivism within the Social Democratic Party in Russia. And this subjectivism originated in the work of the, the philosopher Mach. And of course, fashionable subjectivist philosophies continue to exist. They continue to exist on the left, and reading this polemic from over a hundred years ago is a very useful way of preparing oneself to critique this kind of subjectivism. Now, go back to 1904 and think of the intellectual atmosphere of the time. If you went back a decade or two earlier, or even then actually, the, the foremost proponents of mechanical materialism in the 19th, end of the 19th century, early 20th century, were Boltzmann and Thompson. Boltzmann in Austria, Thompson in Glasgow. Now, they were putting forward an atomistic materialism which the French mathematician Poincaré rather scathingly called the English kinetic theory. Although, as I say, Boltzmann was Austrian and Thompson Scottish. Now, Mach certainly was Austrian. He was professor of philosophy at the University of Vienna. And the latter part of Boltzmann's life was spent in what m must have seemed to him to be a hopeless battle to get the German-speaking scientific community to accept his ideas about atoms and about energy and about entropy. Because this most pr prestigious position, Professor of Philosophy at Vienna, was occupied by Mach, who was a staunch anti-atomist and anti-realist. And the ideas of Mach had a huge general influence on a generation of science, scientists in Central Europe. And echoes of his philosophical approach still continue to this day in controversies over quantum mechanics, largely through the indirect role of Werner Heisenberg. But that's a topic for a different discussion. We have contemporary subjectivism, like the Copenhagen interpretation in physics, which was not a Copenhagen interpretation. It was Werner Heisenberg's interpretation. And in his attempt to get away from the calumny associated with him having tried to develop atom bombs for Hitler, he tried to claim that these ideas had been developed in Copenhagen, not by him. The second strong trend of this, which is surprisingly particularly strong in Latin America at the moment, is the Mises-Hayek subjectivist school of economics, which again 
comes from Vienna. And now, in Anglo-Saxon countries, we have the influence of the philosopher Butler and her subjectivist identity theories. Now, this was a tragic story in that Boltzmann, who was probably the greatest physicist of the 19th century, was actually driven to taking his own life in despair at his inability to make headway against the prejudices of Mach and his followers. Now, what were these ideas of Boltzmann? They are ideas which seem perfectly reasonable and commonplace now. Was that atoms exist, that heat is due to the motions of atoms, that the random movement of atoms will, over time, cause entropy to increase, and that this increase in entropy is why time appears to have a direction, which is a very fundamental question, the so-called arrow of time. Without Boltzmann's ideas, we would, for example, have no statistical mechanics, We'd have no information theory either, since Shannon's information theory is founded on Boltzmann's analysis of entropy. And right down to the present day, Boltzmann's analysis of entropy is providing the basis for Velinda's entropic theory of gravity, which is one of the current contenders for modified Newtonian dynamics. Now, what did Mach believe in contrast. Mach was a defender of the old caloric theory of how heat. It's difficult to believe now, but it was the idea that heat was a substance in the same sense that electric charge was. And Mach argued in the 1870s and continued to republish these ideas right to the end of the 19th century that if we accept that electric charge exists, we should accept that caloric exists. And the movement of atoms was just a figment of Boltzmann's imagination. Um, I'll publish details of his argument and a point-by-point -point refutation of his attempt to prove the existence of caloric. Obviously, this is now outdated, but just to explain how even any competent theorists in the 19th century should have been able to see the loopholes in Mach's um, argument for caloric. And the source of this is Mach's book, The History and Root of the Principle of Conservation of Energy. Now, if Mach was willing to accept that energy existed, why didn't he accept that atoms exist? You might think that the scientific worldview would accept both. Well, the worldview of science in the late 19th century was much more contested than now. There was something called vitalism. There was a 19th century idea, there was still the notion that life and consciousness was due to energy. The notion that there was such a thing as a vital spark. You've probably all seen B-movie Frankenstein films in which energy in the form of divine lightning from heaven revitalizes Frankenstein's monster. This is the 20th century retelling of that 19th century theory. Now, this has a religious implication. You could be a devout Catholic, for example, like the theorist Tia de Shada, and believe in energy because you could make out that energy was something mystical and divine. But the purely atomistic, mechanical theories of Boltzmann and Thompson were completely incompatible with religion. Now, we're talking about Austria, which was an empire in that stage. It was a great world power. Vienna was one of the major capital cities of the world. And to become a professor at Vienna, like Mach did, you had to be personally appointed by the emperor. 
It was a strongly Catholic country. There was very strong social pressure to produce philosophy that was compatible with the official state religion. Now, energetics could be made Catholic compatible, whereas atomism had been denounced by the church for centuries or even millennia, going right back to their denunciation of the classical theorists of atomism, Epicurus and Lucretius. Lenin's, let's go through Lenin's uh, response to this. Lenin's response focuses on this social context of Marx's work. And he argues that Marx's epistemology derived ultimately from the work of the British religious philosopher Bishop Berkeley. Who, and this reduced science to correlations between sense data and denied that it obtains knowledge of an independently existing material world. And this was explicitly constructed by Berkeley to leave the door open for a religion under the impact of the Newtonian revolution. He denied the existence of matter he said that all that exists are sensory impressions. And later, Ma claimed, according to Lenin, that in effect, science was just a correlation between sense data and readings on instruments. Hence, for Ma, atoms were just something that were imagined. They didn't really exist. Something imagined to account for the perception of heat, and it was the perception of heat which was all that was real. Now, Einstein's contribution was non-political, came in two key papers, and to some extent uh, a third paper. The first one on the movement of small particles suspended in stationary liquids, and the second one concerning a heuristic point of view towards the emission and transformation of light. Now, how could this have anything to do with mass philosophy? Let me explain. Paper 1 sets the stage by showing that the Brownian motion of small particles suspended in water could be quantitatively predict predicted from the molecular kinetic theory of Thomson and Boltzmann. And Einstein showed that if one assume, makes an assumption about the size of Avogadro's number, then if you take a, a sphere one micron across, say a pollen grain, it could be expected to wander six microns per minute due to the random bombardments of water molecules. Alternatively, if one were by experiment to obtain accurate measurements of the movements of such, water, or such particles in water, you'd get a more precise estimate of Avogadro's number. In fact, this was very quickly experimentally proved by Perrin in 1909, who used very small droplets or tiny spheres of latex in water. And in the process, he refined the estimate of Avogadro's number. Avogadro's number is the number of atoms in a gram mole of a substance. What did this demonstration show? It showed that atoms were real. It showed that although atoms were too small to see, the combined effect of the movement of a lot of atoms could produce visible motion. And only if atoms really existed would the predicted scale of movement of these tiny particles in water be observed. And this is the strongest type of scientific theory because it deduces a previously unobserved quantitative result from an underlying causal mechanism that has already been postulated. The underlying causal mechanism being Boltzmann-Thomson theory of heat. The second paper by Einstein produce even bigger implications. 
He showed that not only do atoms exist, but light is also made up of discrete particles. Now, the Greek term atom means uncuttable. And light is made up of uncuttable components, or quanta, which we now call photons. He, and Einstein's demonstration of this rests explicitly on Boltzmann's theory of entropy. Basically what he does, he shows that light entropy changes with the volume of a cavity exactly the same way as gas entropy changes with volume. And from this he concludes that light must be part particulate and made up of what we now call photons. And it's important to note that he didn't, his arguments, if you read them, don't sneak in any prior assumption about the particulate nature of light. Um, instead he derives it, he, he deri the evidence he uses is derived from already empirically established results by Planck about the formula for black body radiation and its relationship to temperature. A final paper the same year produced his most f famous formula E equals mc squared and this is a paper called Does Inertia of a Body Depend on Its Energy Content? And it established the equation for the equivalence between matter and energy. Now, just think about that for a moment. In the context of Marx energetics, the conclusion that matter and energy were equivalent to one had philosophical as well as immense practical relevance. Philosophically, it undermined the ability to appeal, appeal to Marxian energetics as an alternative to materialism. Because matter and energy were shown to be equivalent. And historically, of course, it opened up the possibility of atomic power with all that entails. And if anything has fixed the idea of atoms in the general consciousness and displaced Marxian scepticism, it was a demonstration of atomic energy. The summary, then. Lenin's book demolished the intellectual influence of Marxism on the socialist movement, and it did this via ideological and philosophical crit critique of the idealist and religious underpinnings of Marxism. And that's what I urge you to read. Einstein's 1905 papers didn't just produce a revolution in physics because they introduced relativity theory, quantum theory and the possibility of atomic power, but they secured the atomic theory and relegated Marxian energetics to the same intellectual bin as the old phlogiston theory had lived in or been sent to.